So, Dean, about five years ago, I was sacked as the manager of Valencia after four months. Oh, I'm sorry about so that, about... I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're the first person to ever say, I'm really sorry about being sacked in Valencia. Everyone else takes the out of me like... Well, I mean, if you deserved it, then... I mean, this is the moment that you've lived for. I had the potential to make a whole nation of people proud. You've spoken out on racism and experience it yourself. People need to be willing to want to tackle it. Oh! Everybody can be on Instagram and social media, like, hashtag working so hard, hashtag workout Wednesday. It's like, OK, yeah, you can do all that. But when it comes down to it, let's see. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Dina, I just want to say good luck in the Olympics. On this episode of The Overlap, I've come to meet Dina Asher-Smith, the 200 metres world champion. We discuss the relationship between herself and her longtime coach, John Blackie, her preparations for the Tokyo Olympic Games, and the role sport should play in tackling racism. So, hi, Dina, welcome to the overlap, and tell me about this place. Hi, thank you very much for having me. We're at Norman Park in Bromley. And it's where I've trained my whole sporting life, I guess. So I've been here since I was eight years old and it is pretty much a second home. Everybody does come and they do acknowledge that it's not what they expect. <laughs> I would describe it as humble, a little bit like under nines football changing rooms, <laughs> a little bit damp, a little bit dark. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think humble is the key word because for me, the way that I see it, ultimately, it's my job to be the best athlete that I can be, the best version of myself that I can be. And, and how I do that is just by keeping your head down and working hard. I just, I don't like fuss. I don't like too much like drama and stuff. I don't need any of the, the frills. I just like being comfortable, able to be myself. And I think, yeah, when you're comfortable and happy, that's when you can perform the best. Does that grounded approach come from your parents? And your upbringing? Yeah, I think so, because we're a very tight-knit family and they've instilled a lot of the values of hard work and just being grateful for what I'm able to do, what I'm opportunities I have in my life. But at the same time, it comes from my coach, John, as well. I'm forever indebted to him and his patience with me since I was, like, eight years old, all the way up. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but they've just instilled in me very much the value of hard work and understanding that sometimes it doesn't have to be the most fanciest, most fabulous thing. Um, you can get an amazing product with just working hard and getting it done. It's not all about the, the shiny sheen, you know? <laughs> There's this thing about pushy parents, parents that put pressure on, on young athletes or um, their children, but also there is an element of children need stretching, young athletes need stretching. How did they find that balance with you in terms of obviously not pressurising you to the point where it overwhelmed you, but also stretching you so that you did work hard and you knew the value of hard work? Um, I don't think I've ever been pressurised by my parents. I've just actually fundamentally known from my parents that they love me very much. That's basically what is the constant in my life. I'm very, very fortunate because I also know that for a lot of people, that kind of stable foundation isn't always a reality. And I feel very fortunate for that. I don't ever even think I've ever felt stretched. My parents are just like, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? We will try our very hardest to make sure you can try it. They say, we're not promising you're going to be any good because I certainly tried a lot of things. Like I used to play the trumpet. They used to hate that because not only was I not fat, <laughs> but it was noisy and they had to apologize to the neighbors every time I practiced, so like, but I think the fundamental with my parents is just that I know that whatever I do, as long as I'm kind of trying my best, they'll be proud of me. And if I'm rubbish, I can all have a laugh as a family and be like, remember when you tried that? <laughs> I was reading that you, you, you said that you grew up in a competitive environment, though, when you were younger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I say in that, they were very competitive. I think that's just my family. So we used to play dominoes as a family a lot. And they just wouldn't That's let me win. That's old school, dominoes. It is, it? it is. And they just wouldn't let me win. And that just goes <laughs> for, like, so many things. But it wasn't that, like, they wouldn't let me win because they were trying to teach me a lesson. Like, they were just like, no, if we're playing a game, I want to win. <laughs> but what that taught me was also about resilience. Probably in hindsight, that just gave me a lot of confidence just to keep trying. But at the same time, I don't think that was ever in their intention as a teaching point that's just also who they are yeah I mean I'm fascinated by your education in that you are by far the most intelligent sports person that oh. I've ever met <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> you. so I mean straight A's 
a degree in history. Yeah. And whilst twin tracking a, a, an athletics yeah, career. Yeah, go trying to get to the Olympics. That how's was that, definitely. How's that work? Thank you, first and foremost, because intelligence is not just great. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that was definitely something that I'm very proud of um, doing well in school and doing well academically, and particularly the skills that I was able to learn and develop at university and doing that alongside track and field. It was definitely hard work, I have to say. I definitely learned a lot about myself. I went into uni not super organised, came out very organised. Right. <laughs> so it was a learning curve, but I think it helped me develop more as a person than anything because at that point in my life, it would have been um, unnatural of me to just go and do sport or leave sport and just go and do academics. Like, if I wanted to be myself, I would have to do both. For what reason? As a, That's as just a... me. Like, I've always just been a bit nerdy, like, if I'm being honest. You're a bot, you're a bot <laughs> aren't you? No, 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 I'm not. No, there's no... <laughs> so you say this, and then I'll get shows like Mastermind send requests, like, with Dina. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but I think it's just always been an essential part of me. And I've just always wanted to be myself. And I was very much aware of what a career in sports might look like. Like, it, it looks like going into more of a professional setting earlier and really not doing anything else. I was aware that that was a very common route, but I just didn't think that was the best for me because I think in order to be the best version of yourself, which is ultimately what I want to be on track, I have to be happy and I have to be balanced. And I knew that I wanted to go to uni. I knew that I was nerdly really interested in history. I wanted to know what the world was like, to understand where we are now and to be able to look forward to the future. Like I always have just had that kind of thinking. I mean, it's inspirational listening to you because I would say that if, you know, I've got two young girls that are 11 and 12 and the idea that you can play sport at an elite level, but you've got to do something else as well. And the idea that you had that, not everybody has that, do they? Yeah, not everybody does have that. But I think I always like to stray away from trying to say that people should always do both. I always think the key is people should do what's best for them because some people, they'll do both and they'll be totally stressed out and they can't do it. And then they're not happy with their lives and then they think, oh, but I'm supposed to do both. So I always try and be like, do what's best for you. Like the person always knows who they are the best, so do what's best for you. But it is entirely possible to do both. And I would always encourage that because personally for me, really helped my sporting performance as well because it helps put everything into context because, yeah, obviously what I do sprinting, the margins are very, very small. The stakes are quite high. It can be high pressure at times, but like I would go into class and I'd be looking at death tolls and pandemics, epidemics, wars, disease, all these hard hitting topics. And then it made me really grateful that the most difficult thing in my life is to run fast. And when you put that into context yeah. of everything, it kind of makes you relax. And even though the fuss and the, and the noise around it might make it feel like it's really serious, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's not serious, it is really yeah. serious. But in the grand scheme of life, um, I'm very, very lucky that the most stressful thing in my day to day is how fast I get from A to B. Would, would you say, I mean, that mental resilience that you obviously have, is that come from what would be that element to put everything into perspective? Is that your coping mechanism almost, that this isn't that bad, I've just lost a race, or I've just <laughs> yeah. not trained well today? Yeah, I think, I think so, but I think it's also me, like I don't, take things to heart too often. Like, I really, I really don't. I think that's just me. <laughs> I wish I was like that. I don't, I I'm mean, stressed all the time. I'm no, worried, don't I'm be worrying. stressed. Know, don't just... be, like, don't be. It's like, I just, I think it's, I think it's also the nature of the job that I have, because if I was maybe a doctor and a nurse, the stakes would be much higher, because I would be stressed. I have to save somebody's life. Like, <laughs> that's stressful, you know? But I'm just so lucky that what I do is, entertainment, what I do is sport. Of course, I work so hard to make sure that I'm excellent at it and make sure that when I go and do it, it can be as good as possible and I can be successful, of course. I don't want to lose, but like, if we do, like, it's part of it. Like, it's literally part of it. <laughs> I'm just going back to my own football career and thinking, I, I, I wish I could have seen myself as an entertainer, but I never did. <laughs> no, never. No, but I think, no, but I think it's about a balance because like, we are entertainers and like sometimes when it's when it's when there's a problem, it's always useful to take a step back and see yourself as an entertainer. But when you're in it, you have to see yourself as a professional. So I mean, you're going for a degree, you're obviously at this time as well, an elite athlete. And it takes me back to me and my brother played for United at 17, 18, we were starting to earn good money. And my sister was playing for England at Netball. <laughs> yeah. And she's got a completely different life, being funded by her parents, she's doing a degree, I think, in um, 
it was nursery teaching at the time. And ended up having to make that choice, that sort of jump of whether to go for elite athlete or pursue what would be that career. And it is very different for women in sport and for elite athletes that are women in terms of sort of, you know, in, you know we were getting paid. Mm -hmm. Cricketers are getting paid, yeah. rugby players are getting paid. Mm -hmm. But in for my sister, she wasn't. She wasn't getting anything. Yeah. And it's not right, is it? It's not right, no. <laughs> no, it's not right. People love watching sport, full stop. They want to see people win and lose. They want to feel emotions. They want to cry. They want to cheer. They want to have the full emotional spectrum, you know? And the ability to evoke that emotion, that's genderless. Like, the ability to entertain is genderless. But everybody should have the opportunity, if you want to pursue this career, to be able to do so. And, and make money from it. But I think that is definitely changing now. So even as a woman in track and field, or if you're a female tennis player, um, we still have far more commercial opportunities and opportunities to earn money than I guess your sister would have in, in netball when she was at that point. I did have that kind of, do I go for it, do I not? But I have to admit that was more, it wasn't for me, it wasn't financially motivated because I had been pro since I was just, Probably in school. How do you become pro as an athlete? Oh, it's, it's, I, I use averted commas yes. because it's very... Track and field is far more flexible than the other ones, but I just count that. I use the more Americanized term, I guess, when you get your first professional contract with, like, a major shoe brand. OK. But, that, but if I'm being honest, that doesn't constitute being professional in track and field. So it was sponsors field. that were actually funding you at 16 rather than what it would be, say, British Athletics? Or both? How's it work? Both. I was both at that point. Okay. Yeah, I was both at that you point. You were raking I... it, weren't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> the greatest parallel would be penalties. When the gun goes or when you step up, how much nerve do you have? I've somehow ended up in one of your sessions here today. Oh! oh. oh. oh no, no, no. <laughs> So, Dina, one of the most special moments in sport and history in this country was for the 2012 Olympics, that Super Saturday, and you were there. Yeah. Carrying a kit bag. <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. Whose? Do you know whose it was? Or? Oh, no. So, I personally, I can't remember exactly whose kit I carried because I carried so many people. But, yeah, I remember um, that was really, really special. I think that was probably another influential moment in my thinking of me as an athlete because I would have been 16 at that point. Did you see yourself? Could you, this is where I want to be? Ish, ish, that's the thing. I always had this sense of realism, this like, I know I'm talented, or, but like, you still got to work hard. There's still so many rungs and ladders to climb. So I always dreamt and hoped, but I wouldn't say that I was like, that is going to be me. Like, mm. I was hopeful, I was optimistic, and I wanted that. But I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was the reaction of the crowd. And I had never, ever, 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 ever experienced something like the crowd like that ever in my life. And I don't think I ever will. Like, people were crying, people were screaming, cheering. Like, I struggle to describe it because it was honestly indescribable. Like, it, it just quite frankly was. When we saw Greg, Jess and Mo win, I remember just thinking, this reception is crazy. And I'd never really experienced how the public reacts to sport before like that. I remember thinking, by Greg, Jess and Mo going away, keeping their head down, working really hard, just genuinely pursuing their dreams, pursuing their talents and seeing their potential through. They're able to touch so many people in this way. And there are people in the crowd crying and it's like, this isn't Jess's family, it's not her coach, it's not her primary school teacher, it's not people who have personally recognised her. This is just somebody who is so proud and happy of what she's been able to achieve in this moment that they're in floods of tears. And I was like, Sport is so powerful. I just couldn't get over the feeling that so many people were so proud of these people that they've never met before. And I felt very fortunate that I had the potential to effectively make a whole nation of people proud. So nine years forward. Nine, yeah. Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> and you're nearly here. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. It's you're very excited? Weird. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I love or racing. focused? Focus is probably the best point. I mean, we are speaking to me in the middle of a training block, so my brain is definitely <laughs> more about focus, focus, details, doing what I have to do. But I think it is exciting, mainly because I love championships. And it's not that I'm particularly excited for, for an outcome, because nobody has a crystal ball, nobody can anticipate what the season's going to be like, what anything's going to be like. But I just love a challenge. So Tokyo in August is going to be 33 degrees. We're in yes. Bromley. Thank 
God, it's, I love the sun. And it's seven degrees. <laughs> it's how, right now. Does that have an impact on terms of your... How would you prepare for 33 degrees when you're training in seven degrees? Uh, yeah. We'll go and acclimatise before we get there. We'll leave like two weeks before. It's OK for me because the Diamond Leaf circuit typically is in very hot countries. And like we race in America often. We race in... North Africa often, well, in Morocco, we race in Monaco, Italy often. So we are Got like... life, haven't you? I mean, Monaco, no, no, Monaco. I'm, really Monaco. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of the different diamond leagues. I'm I not trying to really partner. Them. I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> no, the season, the season is a good, good fun, I have to say. But um, yeah, so most of our sport is done in the heat. So You're okay it would it, be yeah. more weird to compete in, in seven this. degrees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is the moment that you've lived for. I suppose these next few months and looking at Tokyo do you, I, I don't know how it works in terms of obviously I do in football but have you run that race in your head not yet no not yet <laughs> no 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 simply because um I think everybody's different some people would have um personally no I'll only start visualizing the race probably like a few days beforehand simply because until you start racing you don't get a feeling for what each part of the race should feel feel like if that makes sense because some some seasons different part of your particularly for me different part of your race is stronger or this and the other and so to visualize you have to also understand where your body is yeah. if that makes sense and I haven't we haven't started yet so I think for me visual, the visualization process and stuff like that it happens far far close to the time but I, I am a visualization person so I do do that but it, it's very much like a few days before do you set a time that you know you need to run and that's what you're training towards? No, You don't do that? No, no, no. Simply because, like, you might be fixated on running, I don't know, I want to run 22-0 this year for 200. And, like, you might achieve that, but that might make you not even make the final <laughs> because you might be working towards 22-0 and the other girls are working towards 21-9, you know? <laughs> so, um, no, I just always focus on different aspects of my race and making them all as fast and efficient as possible and trying to piece them together and make sure that it all flows well, which is also why I don't specifically visualise because until you go start going through that. You don't understand what the pieces feel like in your head. Every athlete has a different way of working. But for me, John likes to definitely go on what do I feel like. So he likes to ask me when I feel like I've had a good run because you've got to have the confidence yeah. to stand on your own without looking at yeah. something for reference. Do you set your programme or do you jointly set it in partnership with John? Do you, how, how does the programme...? John Defo is the details person. <laughs> <laughs> You just turn up and do it. Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> but obviously, we, we, we talk through everything. So we, I understand, like, the phases, and I, I, I get it. Yeah. But it's very much his knowledge and experience and leadership on that side of things. It's a big trust. Definitely. I trust John 100%. And I also know that John cares about me as Dina the person as well as Dina the athlete. So I also know that he would never put me in a position for something that I wasn't ready for. He would never falsely build up confidence. He would never lie to me. He would never, do you know what I mean? No. Like some people will fill athletes head with fluff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Yeah, they'll just tell you what you they think you want to hear. And I'm like, no, 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 if I need to run faster, please tell me. Yeah. If you think that something's not working or I'm not working hard enough or which I hope is not the case. Has, but... he, said, has he ever said that to you? No, not that I'm not working hard enough. I get told all the time that I need to do this better but it's not for me not trying it's just that I need to do it better he's told me you need to step this up come on I mean, this isn't good enough you need to do this like I get that all the time and I don't take it personally it's just an objective fact and because we've got the same goal and he knows what I've got to do to get there yeah he's telling me come on come on come on do you have disagreements with him no we've never actually argued nobody believes you've never had an argument no but what's there to argue about what like no but what is there to argue about I can banter him I banter him I definitely ban him. Wind him up all the time. Yeah, 100%. But we never argue. I mean, what is there to argue about? Like, if he tells me this is a session today, I'm not going to go back to him and tell him I don't want to do that. Who do I think I am? Like, do you have a little whinge now sometimes? Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I complain <laughs> all the time. I try and negotiate. <laughs> I try and say, if this one's extra good, can I do one less off the end? He's like, no. I'm like, OK. But I tried. You've had the same coach now for 16, 17 years. Yeah. And I worked on the same coach for nearly 23 years. How do you not get bored of the same message, same voice, same instructions? Because it changes all the time. <laughs> what, the voice does? Or the no, not the voice, the instructions. The instructions. The instructions change. So you change it up, does he, and variety? And... Um, ish, but I think 
I'm really strange. This is not normal, I don't think. I, when, we're, when I'm doing a hard session, I don't like people shouting, go on, Dina, you can do it. Like, I appreciate the sentiment, like, I, but like when I'm running, I'm thinking about stuff. And that's because John's given me different targets, what he wants me to do in each phase, which is why it never gets old. Like sometimes he wants me to really go out really hard and it's gonna be so grueling and so painful because I'm exhausted, but he's like, I want you to get to that point of exhaustion because today we're working on that bit of your race. Or I might do the same distance, but he'll be like, today I want it to be technically like this, which is why it never gets old because I've always got something else to focus on and something else to improve. It might look similar objectively, <laughs> but the instructions and the cues are always very different. Final question on the Olympics, are you on track? Yeah, as far as I understand, yeah. John hasn't told me I'm not on track, so... <laughs> Should we ask John later? Yeah, on ask track? John, I'll probably ask John later. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I should be, yeah. And you feel good? Yeah, I'm really excited. Obviously, it's been so long since I raced and I love competing. Like the thing for me that I always love about sprinting is that it's like an adrenaline rush. Everybody can be on Instagram and social media, like hashtag eat, sleep, repeat. Oh yeah, I lifted this today, working so hard, hashtag workout Wednesday. It's like, okay, yeah, you can do all that. Yeah, yeah, say all that. But when it comes down to it, let's see. And I feel like the greatest parallel would be penalties. It's like, what are you made of? Like, what are you truly made of? Like, when the gun goes or when you step up, like, how much nerve do you have? Because this is the moment. So if it's not now, when, right? And that's what I love about racing. I love that kind of thing. Because I'm always confident that in that moment, I'm going to be OK. Because that's the kind of thing that I absolutely love and live for. So more than anything, I just can't wait to race outdoors again because it's been a strange year. <laughs> yeah, it has. I mean, you mentioned penalties. The only reason you've actually agreed to do this interview today is because your mum is a massive Manchester United <laughs> no, fan. No, I agreed to it because it would be good. But my mum is a humongous Man United fan. Come yeah, tell us about that. Hum yeah, my mum is an absolute huge, huge Man U fan. And I was very much used to knowing everything. I guess it is definitely from, like, Sir Alex Ferguson, your time, that I knew everything just by, like, almost by osmosis, like I just knew it because she was talking about it all the time. And I always know that I'm a Man U fan because I would be disowned if I was anything else. Good. Honestly. No, honestly. And like, so. My mum's that kind of person, if Man U loses, like Monday morning, the office door is shut, nobody comes and talks to her. And I remember there was a time when like some people that she used to work with, they used to get the back page of the newspaper and wave it in their, her window if like they lost and she'd like shut the blinds. Like, <laughs> I She's love, a proper fan. Yeah. I love the fact that you would be still loved if you lost a race, but you're disowned if you didn't support Manchester United. <laughs> I absolutely love that. So, Dina, you've invited me very kindly to train with you this afternoon. This could be horrendous, you know. I'm excited, actually. Warm up properly, please. When did you first realise that she was exceptional and you had something special? I would say it was around about 14 yeah. uh, that things started to uh, look very positive. You still didn't know that she was going to end up as a 200 metre world champion, but you knew that she was capable of some really spectacular athletic events. Dina's always inspired me, always. I would have given up some while ago, but no, she is inspirational, not just for athletes, but for us as coaches. Is she extracting every last bit of talent out of herself with the work that she puts in, in your mind? Not yet. There's more. There's definitely more. Set up some problems with me. No, this is just to get everything activated. It's doing its job. <laughs> I've somehow ended up in one of your sessions here today, which apparently is quite a unique experience. To be fair, this is an easy session. <coughs> That's the why. This is the end of a four-week block, and in week four, I always reduce volumes and intensities. That's more than ten. Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because ten is like two. You know, one is like two, That's what I mean. If you're going to do the whole session, we do have wheelbarrows. <laughs> so we can, we can pick you up at the end. Can you make sure the car on the way back is like a, a limo with a bed in it or something? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, off you go. The power's unbelievable. And then into sea skips. Oh! oh. 
You have to separate the movements. We started to do some of this, you know, before I retired. Sort of like the, 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 the sort of bounce, these sort of quick movements, so get you sort of quicker. But I wish I'd had it in the early 90s. You know, I think I'd have been a maybe a bit quicker. Maybe I'll explore a bit more light, you know. If I... Oh, that's cheeky, isn't it? <laughs> coordination has always been a problem for me. Anything that sort of remotely needs coordination, I'm done, finished. Finished. <laughs> so what you have to do there, Gary, is huh? separate the movements. Yeah. As opposed to doing all the movements in one, yeah. you actually separate. So you do a movement and then come back. Next movement, come yeah. back. John was saying you need to separate the movements. Yeah, I thought they were very separate. It felt very, very separate to me. <laughs> so 40 metres, chaps. Dina, Gary, to the line. Stand by. Oh. Oh. Quick was that? Okay, let's do the next one, please. Do I get a 10 meter start, coach? They can catch me, you know what I mean? Come on, coach. Okay, we, do Give me a we, we do do that. Give me a 10 meter start. But do you, you if you start on that blue line, do you think you can get there before doing No. Go oh, on yeah, the blue line. Are. If you look up demoralise in the dictionary, there's going to be a, a video of this. No, no, no. Stand by. Oh. Oh. oh, no, no. I knew it would go. Oh. oh, no, not his hamstring. Yeah, it was always going to go, wasn't it? Oh. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 I'm good. But, yeah, seriously, be careful. Because <laughs> we definitely do this, like, how many days a week? Coach! <laughs> you didn't warm me up properly. <laughs> <laughs> Coach of the year! He pulls me, pulls me hamstring! <laughs> You've spoken out on racism and experience it yourself. Lots of the discourse that needs to change about racism is people need to be willing to want to tackle it. As a black woman, the people who are perpetrating it are less likely to listen to me because of the colour of my skin. Have you seen a big change since the murder of George Floyd in terms of approach of um, sporting bodies, football, athletics, to tackle racism more seriously or not? Not really. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but publicly I think football has been the one that's done the most change, particularly on the troll side. So I say that one has been a big change. Social but media side. Social media of, side yeah. of stuff, I think that's really good. But I've seen a lot of people want to be seen to be doing good, but I don't know if that's been any real, you know. What do you think of taking the knee? Obviously, the football, for every Premier League and actually football league match, the players take the knee. Yeah. What do you think of it? Do you think it's having any impact? Do you think it's good? I mean, some black players have actually, in the last few weeks, Yeah, because I was thinking about it. that. I was thinking, I've seen some report. I, to be fair, I think I personally think it's good because I think back to the roots, which is Colin Kaepernick, and I still think that is so powerful because it was such a peaceful and succinct way of illustrating a point. So I want to read out a couple of tweets that you've tweeted from your account, June 8, 2020. I vividly remember wandering into Burberry on New Bond Street last year, wanting to get one of their new bags. They ignored me until I legit tracked someone down. They asked me if I wanted to get it right now and asked me whether it was actually for me or if I was a stylist. And then the next tweet reads, and I also distinctly remember going into Kate Spade on Regent Street a while ago and the security latched onto me from the moment I stepped in the store, was fuming, so I left after about 10 minutes of being followed. This happens so, so often. Yeah. That isn't even the only times. Like, I gave two examples that were, like, the most recent in my life. Those happened just before the pandemic. Yeah. But th that is something that happens often. You can interchange those names with many other shops, like, many. <laughs> I mean, you've spoken out on racism and experience it yourself, and you've spoken out so often about it. What is the plan? How can sport enable us to fix this problem or help fix this problem in this country? That's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I, 
I should be into good. you. I should no. do this. For the last of this <laughs> no, morning. it's good. And I'm actually happy you asked me that question. Because I always really... think people identify the problem. And I sat yeah. in a football changing room with England when Ashley Cole and other players were racially abused and didn't do anything. And I've admitted that and spoken about it. You know, he sat next to me in the changing room. And then you just go and get on the bus, you get changed, and you move on with your life. I think there's a... I and think nothing happens. A, yeah, and I think I'm happy that you've asked that question because I feel more comfortable to talk to you about it. Because often what I've found is... Even though I've said that and I've written articles about it and stuff, often I always think twice about talking about it if the question the person asks me is, but does that exist? Is that real? Did that really happen? Do people word questions like that too? hundred percent. All the time. All the time. Because lots of people try and engage a subject as if it's like a debate and as if this is something that we should argue or fact check, double check. And don't get me wrong, like we, we have to hold yeah. people to account. Like I'm not trying to hide from accountability at all. But I think lots of the discourse that needs to change about racism is people need to actually be willing to want to tackle it. And I take inspiration from my friend, Clara Amphos, who's in radio. From a music perspective, she said, everybody loves the contribution that different races, black people, contribute to the music scene. But when, like, stuff goes on against black people, people are very silent. But then when it's time to re-engage with something that's good, people are very keen to do it. And she used a brilliant phrase, which was, if you're with us for the highs, please be with us for the lows as well. And I think that's where sport can have a big role because quite rightly, 95% of the time, people see me as somebody that like um, runs for Great Britain and they're very proud of and they're happy to follow my career as well, right? But by me being me, the colour of my skin, if stuff happens to me, people will be very quick to distance themselves. And I'm like, hang on a second, hang on a second. We're all for, we're all for it when it's like a great thing, but people want to vanish when it gets hard. So I would say the sports role is to be with us through that. And I say that to the sports industry and to sports. And I'm probably thinking in my mind when I see, sadly, the footballers getting lots of of, of abuse online. And what I think is nice is that lots of the clubs now have turned around and said, no, we're on their side, you can't do this because as a black woman, I can talk about it, but like the people who were perpetrating it are less likely to listen to me because of the color of my skin. Do you know what I'm saying? I think it's essential that people who might not be on the receiving end do also take a stand and definitely use their voice to stamp out racist abuse, stamp out racism. And I think sports has a humongous platform to do that. Is the mind games before a race? If they think the best chances they have to win the race is by distracting me, that says a lot. I read that if you were having a tough session, you think about McDonald's apple pie. Yeah. I used to think about the Chinese that I would have a Oh win. my God, see, you get it. Dina, I just want to say good luck in the Olympics. So Dina, this section is called Failure is a bruise, not a tattoo. So about five years ago, I was sacked as the manager of Valencia after four months. Oh, I'm sorry about Just that, about... I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's sad. The, the, no, but like, you said first... that I was sacked. I'm sorry, it's sad, right? Dina, you're the first person <laughs> to ever say I'm really sorry about me being sacked in Valencia. Everyone else takes <laughs> out of me like Oh. <laughs> Deserved it then. Yeah, but I'm I still deserved sorry. it. Yeah. It must have been upsetting. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was it was a bad moment at the time. It was my low point. Mm. And I'm going to ask you what your low point has been in your life so far. Whenever people bring up the word failure, it often it always draws a blank in my brain because I just don't really think of things as failure. My mum's always like, "What can you learn from it?" And my dad's always like, "It's okay. You know, if this hadn't happened, you wouldn't have learnt this. So take it forward." So that's how I very much am programmed to think about these things. But I think probably it's not getting into the secondary school that I did end up going to first time round when I was 11 with the 11 plus exams. And it's the most random failure, but it's definitely the thing that sticks out to me because I remember being in floods of tears, crying, probably one of the only times in my life where I've really been upset with like something. I remember in the process for that exam, my mum was like, do you want to just look over the exams and maybe practice what it's looked like? And I was like, meh. I was just like, more interested in playing outside. And then girls that were in my class as well, they were very much doing what their parents said, yeah. sensibly. <laughs> and uh, when the exam came, like, I did it. And then I was like one mark off the boundary of getting in. And I remember being so upset because I just always envisaged that I was going to go to that school. My best friend, still to this day now, Sophie, she got in first time. And I'd always, always imagined that me and Sophie would go to school together. Yeah. And for an 11 year old, suddenly I was like, 
so I'm not going to school with Sophie anymore. Thankfully, I got in a few weeks later, but I remember that vow was, I am never leaving anything to chance ever, ever again. <laughs> and I learned that at like 11, yeah. So I think that learning curve at 11, I was like, okay, yeah, we're not gonna be slapdash <laughs> with things anymore. Yeah. And what's your coping mechanism if things are tough? Oh, I always think that tough things are temporary. Everything's temporary, but I'm very much of- How do you get through them then? I get through them the same way I get through the good moments. I'm not cynical, disclaimer, but everything's temporary. So that means when something's really good, enjoy it and go for it, live it up, all are in the moment. But when it's bad, even though your little corner of the world might feel like a thunderstorm, <laughs> life still goes on and it's gonna be okay. Things always keep moving. So it, I guess for me, it's about balance. I read somewhere that if you were having a particularly tough session, you think about McDonald's apple pie. Yeah. Not, yeah, not just McDonald's one. I vis, I, yeah. Apple pie. It reminds me, I, I, love used to, apple pie. I used to think about the Chinese that I would have, the Chinese takeaway. Oh my God, see, you get it, you get I, it. That was, my, yeah. that was my mechanism during a Thank match you. or during a training session. Thank you. I love my Chinese. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. If I've got like a tough session or I'm in the gym and I've got, and I'm like halfway awful. through a plank yeah. or I'm like, oh, and it's just, I just zone out. I'm like, right, it's time to turn off that side of my brain now. I'm on a beach. The burning that you feel is the sun. You are getting a tan. You are sitting there with a cocktail in your hand. And but then you're not. by obviously not. <laughs> but then by the time you've used your brain to go to that place, you hear right, time's up. And then you're yeah, done. And you've got through it. Yeah. That is a lot of when I'm training, I do a lot of zoning out. I hum too. <laughs> if I'm running and it's really hard, sometimes I hum like a weird song. Can I don't even can you know. Give us a little oh, that's it. Mm hmm <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it's not even a song. Like sometimes I just, I just do something else. Do you need music to train? No, I don't like training. You don't like training music, music, no. I warm up to music yeah. on a race day, but normally it's to stop people coming and talking to me <laughs> so I can concentrate. You know that thing where you just put headphones in yeah. and there's nothing playing? Like I'm, I'm definitely one of those people. Is that my? <laughs> is the mind games before a race? Or I have personally you you don't, don't partake. Does, does anybody else? I definitely else? have people try it on me. Have they? But I mind my own business too much, so. Right. So what do they, they do? Sometimes people like decide to warm up in my lane or the lane yeah. that I've taken. You get annoyed with that? Or no, no, I just think it's really sad because I always, when I'm going into a race, I will devote the last moments of time with my coach and with all the support team to doing what I can to better my performance. And that's rarely dependent on anybody else. But in that moment, you're just trying to think about winning. So you're trying to do what is best for you to win the race. If they think the best chances they have to win the race is by distracting me, that says a lot. Yeah. So I don't play mind games, but I like the bend of a 200. Mm. I like chasing people down. That's yeah. a fun game that I like to play. Is that where the humming comes in around the corner? No, no, I'm, no, I'm no. here, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> like a shark. No, I have to, it's not mind games, but I, I enjoy chasing people. So that must be demoralising as you go past someone, right? like, oh. I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, everybody's got different strengths to their race. Yeah. So some people, their best bit of the race is the final bit. So they might be like way back, but they know they're going to claw back. So everything's very personal in track. So if, if, <laughs> if you're a strong bend runner and somebody's taking you over on the bend, and that's demoralising because that's your strength and you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's your last thought when you're on the block? Is it a repeated thought that you always yeah, it's, have? Yeah, um, oh, no, it's not always the same. It's not always the same? What is, the, what is that thought that you're going to have in your Normally, head? Normally, John gives me one cue, as in one thing that he wants me to do really well in that race. So if it's a Diamond League race, which we use as more of, like, yeah. growth towards a championship, that will probably be a training cue, like, right, I really want you to push when you hit here. Or I want you to think about maintaining this whatever in the race. So it'll be a technical cue sometimes. But in a championships, I'm always just kind of saying, enjoy it. Like you've done all the hard work to this moment. I already have my best within me and I'm just gonna bring it out. Do you have a psychologist within your team? Yeah, definitely. I started having regular appointments with her during the pandemic. Mental health is a kind of thing that until something goes wrong, you don't realise something was going wrong, right? That's what I've witnessed in other people. Like, they feel like they're fine, they feel like they're fine, then suddenly they're not fine. And then they look back and they're like, oh yeah, I haven't been fine for six months. So I was like, hmm, let me just see a psychologist because the Olympics is in a year. And personally for me, I want to put my best foot forward in a year's time. 
Did you feel something though that made you go and no, do it? No, honestly, this is me just no. being a planner. I also got a nutritionist. I also changed loads and loads of things. They got your favorite pie. Yeah, this is. Oh no, I don't eat that. <laughs> so I think about it. I don't. I'm an Olympian, <laughs> and that's what I mean. I think about it because okay. it's a goal. Oh, so you don't eat it. You just think about no. apple pie. That must be torturous. No, it's okay because by the time the rep's done, it's gone out of my brain because I'm in so much pain. You're not thinking about food anymore. You're like, oh, how many more of these do I have to do? <laughs> but no, I don't eat it. So I made lots of changes throughout the pandemic when we were at home because in track and field, we don't play or, or publicly compete as much as football does. But in terms of cycles, there isn't much time because we only get about four weeks off a year and then we're back into training however many days a week you train. For me, that's six and you're often always pushing towards the next championships, the next goal, and because we work in such rigid training blocks, there's often very little room for change. So I thought, we're in the middle of this pandemic, we've got an extra year before the Olympics, so let's just add in all the stuff that I didn't add in after World Championships last year because we didn't have enough time. There used to be a stigma attached to going and seeing a psychologist and a lot yeah. of people don't go and seek support. So I think it's quite important. I mean, I went to saw one during my career but would never have announced it during my career because yeah. it was always seen as a weakness. Yeah, so I think that is definitely changing. I think it's one of the things that I think is an Americanism that we're very much taking and think we should probably take on more and more. That Seeing a psychologist doesn't have to be because it's a problem. But I didn't go because I actually hadn't issue or a problem, for me, it was part of my performance because where I want to go and where I want to achieve, like it's we're getting to the pinnacle, it's making sure that everything is geared towards that. And it would be unwise of me to leave something so big, like mental and your like mentality, leave it up to chance as well. Even though I don't think it's up to chance, but you know, kind of leave it in the wind. Finally, on the overlap, we give a gift to everybody that comes on the show. And this one actually isn't for you, it's for your mum. I know I was your mum's favourite Manchester United, but I must, <laughs> I must have been. But I thought she might like a message from this man. Hey Julie, so I hear that you're a die-hard Manchester United fan and that you have also forced Dina to support us as well, which, by the way, great work. No way! <laughs> it's no. Delicious. Dina, I just want to say good luck in the Olympics. We'll all be rooting for you. Go and bring those golds home. Better than me, then. No, no, no. <laughs> and I would have liked one from you as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. No problem at all. Thank you. Thank you.